Well, hey guys, welcome back. It's so good to be back here with you for another House Church message. And you may remember that quite a bit ago now, before we kind of took a little break from House Church teachings and we're focusing on the podcast, that we opened up the book of Colossians together and I kind of taught part of the first chapter. Well, since then, I felt prompted to just finish the book. And so that's what we're going to be doing together. We're going to be studying through the book of Colossians in our house churches. And it's going to be about 20-minute messages with some questions at the end. And so that's kind of going to be our new rhythm for now. And I'm really, I'm really excited for it. So if you remember, book of Colossians, open up with me. Paul is probably writing this around 63 AD. He's probably in Roman custody. And it's possible that he's never been to Colossae himself. That was new to me when I studied this recently. It's, it is possible that Paul had never actually been here. And that it was Epaphras who came to him and, and was shared with him what God was doing in Colossae and the issues they were facing, the doctrinal issues that prompted Paul to write this letter. So Paul is kind of confronting this weird um, religious I I don't even know how to describe it. They got multiple issues going on. It actually kind of reminds me of what we face in our current culture in Ashland, Oregon, with the kind of the new agey feel and religiosity and blending it all together. And it's possible that what they were facing was a form of early Gnosticism. Um, There was this mystical, legalistic Judaism mixed into it. There was some elaborate angelology, angelology, blah, Uh, the study of angels, the maybe even the worship of angels, some weird angel, angel, blah, never mind, angelology, there it is, and uh, in that, thinking that angels could be like mediators between them and God, just some weird things that they were working through and facing, almost this, kind of like the spirit over material, spirit over the body, Um, so Paul writes this beautiful letter to them, and then and that's the book of Colossians, to address this issue. So we'll start in verse 1. We'll read back down to verse 9, which is what we're picking up. And if you haven't watched the first message, you can go back and find it on our YouTube channel and watch it there. But it says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and the faithful brethren in Christ who are in Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to God and... We give thanks to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of your love for all the saints, because of the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, of which you heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel, which has come to you as it has also in all the world, and is bringing forth fruit as it is also among you since the day you heard and knew the grace of God and truth. As you also learned from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf who also declared to us your love in the Spirit. This is where we pick up today. For this reason, we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work, increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might, according to his glorious power for all patience, long-suffering with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of His love, in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation, for by Him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him. He is before all things and in him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. Man, I love this portion we get to study today because today we get to talk about Jesus as the preeminent one. And we'll, we'll talk more about that as we get there. But let's go back to verse 9, and we'll start there. And this is what it says. For this reason, we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to ask. And this is so beautiful to me because I like the idea of Paul not having met these people. 
but he's heard about the work God is doing in them and through them. He's heard that the gospel has made it to Colossae. And it's possible that guys like Epaphras had heard the word, maybe even from Paul themselves, because Paul had been doing missionary journeys. And then they took that word home with them to their fellow countrymen, and they had shared it, people like Epaphras and others. And that's how the gospel had probably been spread in Colossae. And so Paul, hearing about this work, is moved to pray for them. And I love this idea because it's kind of weird. You and I in the church, we don't, that's not always our first inclination when we hear about God doing a work in somebody else's life. Um, it's not always the first thing we think about to pray for them. But honestly, I think that's the right response. Paul's praying for these people he's never met. And I think there's a place for you and I to be praying for the work God is doing all over the world when we hear about it. When we hear about a good work going on in Africa or Asia or Europe or the church next door to us, our response should be to pray for them. Pray that God blesses it. Pray that God continues it. Pray that God covers it and guards it because when God is working so often, Satan wants to get in there and mess it up like he's trying to do to the Colossians. So Paul says, man, we're praying for you guys. In fact, we do not cease to pray for you, continually laboring in prayer over these guys that the word of the Lord would take root in them. And this is what he asked, that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Guys, if you don't know what to pray for others, if you don't know what to pray for yourself, pray this. Somebody once said that Paul here is praying for the things that truly matters in people's life. They're, they're saved, they're forgiven. Um, and what they truly need to know at this point is the will of God for their life. They need to take hold of the truth that God has for them. And so Paul prays that they'd be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding that they would know what God wants to do, what God is trying to accomplish, the work he's called them to, the faith he's called them to, and they would understand that in wisdom and in spiritual understanding. Look what else he prays for them, that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him. Man, what a prayer that they would walk worthy of the Lord. And I realize for some of us, we read this verse and it's easy to start to feel condemned. Like, oh man, I don't walk worthy of the Lord. I'm not fully pleasing him. My life isn't fruitful in every good work. And, and yet we're so quick to go to the negative and I don't think that's what God wants. In fact, if you go back to the very beginning of this book, Paul already told them who they were in Christ. Look back at verse two, it says, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ who are in Colossae. The word saint is hagios. It means a most holy thing. Paul had already told them, you guys, as God's children, you are saints. You are most holy things. You are set apart for God himself. You are his special people, his special treasure, his inheritance in this world. And so his prayer for them is that they would walk, and they would walk worthy of the Lord that according to the knowledge that they received, that they would walk in it, that they would live up to, maybe not even live up, but they would live out who God called them to be. You know, Peter in his epistle right into the church, he said, be holy as I am holy. He's quoting what God said. This is what the Lord wants. He wants us to be holy as he is holy. And you and I understand that it's through the blood of Jesus and the spirit of God that I've, I've been cleansed and forgiven and now I can live a life that is pleasing to the Lord. It's not even all on me. Philippians, Paul would write and say, you know what, God has worked in you and I to will and to do for his pleasure. I think that's Philippians. It actually might be Colossians, we'll find out. But God has worked in you and I to will. The desire to live for God and please God and the power to do it actually comes from him. And so Paul would pray for them that they would walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. I love this. Jesus said to his disciples that by this, his father is glorified, that we bear much fruit as his disciples. You remember that, John 15? God's desire for his children, for his people, is that we would bear fruit that the fruit of the Spirit, the work of the Spirit, the righteousness of God in our life, the peace of God in our life, the guidance of God in our life, our surrender to the Lord, that would bear fruit in our life. Our repentance when we've made mistakes, when we're correct and we respond, that the fruit of God would be 
produced in our lives, the fruit of righteousness. What a beautiful prayer. And I would encourage you, pray that for yourself. Pray that for your loved ones. Pray that for the church next door that God's working in. Lord, would they know your will? God, would they walk in a way that is worthy of you, pleasing you? Would they be fruitful? You know, maybe you're struggling in your own walk. And I love what Pastor Mark says. Sometimes the place to start is just wanting to want what God wants for you. And saying, Lord, I desire to have a life that is pleasing to you. I desire to walk in a way that is worthy of you, that becomes you. I, I'm d desiring to have a life that is fruitful to you. That my life would produce the fruit of the Spirit, the fruit of righteousness, an offering that is pleasing to you, Lord. And wherever you are right now, you could pray that. And just say, Lord, I've struggled, but Lord, help me to live a life that is fruitful for you. I believe that's a prayer that God will answer, and it's a prayer that honors God. Because in that, God is glorified when you and I are bearing fruit, his people. But here's the key, guys. Jesus also says in John 15 that he is the vine, and we are the branches. And as the branch abides in the vine and it bears fruit, so you and I, when we abide in Christ, we bear fruit. Jesus said, apart from me, you can do nothing. I love that, that the truth always comes back to Jesus, that Jesus is the answer to your problem. He's the answer um, to what you're facing right now. He is always the solution in Jesus. So dwelling in the Lord, abiding in the Lord, walking in his ways, obeying him, dwelling in his love. And this is what he says, being fruitful in every good work, increasing in the knowledge of God. I mean, that's Paul's heart for these Christians, that they would increase in their knowledge of God. We've talked about it before, but so often as Christians, we get saved and that's good enough for us. And we're just content to be babies in the faith and not really grow. Maybe we learn the ABCs, the alphabet of the faith, but we don't really mature and grow in the Lord. And yet Paul here, his heart, his prayer for these Colossians is that they would actually increase in their knowledge of God that their understanding of him would be growing and maturing, that they would be learning. See, part of the issue they had, the false doctrine and all that, was because they didn't have a full understanding or they weren't growing in that full understanding of God's word, of God's will. They were struggling. So Paul's prayer for them, that they would increase in the knowledge of God. And guys, if you want to know the quickest way, one of the quickest ways to increase in the knowledge of God, it's right here. It's reading this book. This is the word of God. Paul wrote in Timothy, 2 Timothy, that the, that the very words of this Bible are God breathed. Theopneustos, he made, he made a word up, coined his own word. It's God breathed. This is the inspired word of God. My youth pastor used to tell me, if you, if you smell the Bible, you could smell the breath of God coming off the pages. And he would always joke and smell and be like, oh, is that a hint of onion? You know, youth pastors making us all laugh. But it's so true. God has inspired this word. He's breathed it out. And if you want to know how to live a life that is worthy of God, uh, pleasing to God, fruitful to God, if you want to increase in the knowledge of God, you're gonna find that right here in his word. His grace, his redemption, his power, of his spirit that is in you and me. It's all in here if you want to know. So I'd encourage you guys to be hungry for it, to read it daily, to eat it up, to take it inside and let God speak to you through his word. Let's keep moving. He said, strengthened with all might. This is his next thing he prays for them, that they would be strengthened with all might according to his glorious power for all patience and long suffering with joy. This word might is dynamis or dunamis, and it is where we would get our words dynamic or dynamite, and it literally means strength, power, ability. Isn't that powerful? God's strength, his power in yours and mine's life is strength, power, and ability. And, and I just love this because he just talked about living a life that is pleasing to God. And so many of us probably heard that and said, I just can't do it on my own. I just don't have the ability. 
And yet the very next thing Paul prays for them is God's dunamis, dynamic, dynamite power in their lives. That they'd be strengthened by his power, his ability to do. And what is he praying that they would do? He's praying that they would be patient and long-suffering with joy. Because sometimes in the Christian life, it's difficult. It's hard. We face trials and tribulations. We face persecution. Here in the U.S., maybe not so much in a physical sense, but overseas, many people persecuted even to death for their faith. What should we be praying for one another? We should be praying for God's enabling dunamis power in each other's lives. When somebody is struggling around you or when you are struggling, the right thing to do is to come to God and say, Lord, strengthen me with your power. Strengthen me with your might. Endless is the energy and power of God. Endless. There's nothing God cannot do. There's nothing God cannot support you through, strengthen you through. He's infinite, eternal, great. Paul's prayer for them, Lord, strengthen them. And I love it that he says, according to his glorious power. Man, God's power is so glorious in yours and mine's life. Part of the issue you and I have is we try to do things in our own strength. And we should be learning from the prayer of Paul and say, Lord, let us do it in yours. Yours is the power and ability. Your strength, Lord, is the dunamis power. Let's keep going. Verse 12, it says, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. And I love this verse. <clears throat> but the thing that catches me about this verse is it says, the Father who has qualified us. That word is, I think it's pronounced hikaneu, hikaneu, hikanu, I don't know. Um, but it means that God has rendered us fit. And that's like shocking. God has qualified, he has rendered you and me fit to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in his light. And if you're new to the Bible or new to the gospel, you might go, how does that work? I mean, if we're talking about God is holy and I need him and I'm not holy, then how do I become, how does he render me fit to inherit uh, his, the salvation and the light with his saints? Well, for you, you and I who know the Bible, we know the answer is it's the blood of Jesus. And we're gonna get there here in a second. But God has, is the one who has qualified us, not you and me, not our works. But when we came to God and we asked for salvation, the righteousness of Jesus was imputed to us. And it's no longer um, about what you and I have done because it's about what he has done for you and I. Paul would write in Romans that if it was by works, if you and I could do something to qualify ourselves, then it, God would owe us a debt. But Paul says it's not, it's not like that. God doesn't owe anyone anything. And Isaiah would say that our righteousness is like filthy rags anyways before God. It's not enough. The best we can bring is not good enough because even our best as humans fall short of God's holy perfection, his standard. But it's through the son and the blood of Jesus that you and I have been qualified. We've been washed clean. We have received the righteousness of God imputed to our lives through faith. So let's keep reading. So they've been made saints and they've joined into the inheritance of the saints in the light. Verse 13, he has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the son of his love. What a truth. What a truth. If you are in Christ, you have been qualified to partake in his inheritance, his salvation. If you are in Christ, you have been delivered from the power of darkness, the kingdom of Satan, which is bondage and slavery and fear. The truth is, if you are in Christ, you have been delivered from that kingdom. Spurgeon's got a great quote where he says, you and I, we're gonna fight against Satan. I'm gonna paraphrase it. We're gonna fight against Satan. We're gonna be tempted, but the reality is that Satan is no longer our master. He's not our king. We do not belong to him. We belong to Jesus. And though he would tempt us, you and I can resist him because we're no longer part of his kingdom. He's not our master. He has no hold on you and I. It doesn't mean we won't struggle. It doesn't mean we won't feel tempted, but you and I can be victorious through Christ, because we have been conveyed out of the kingdom of darkness. Delivered, excuse me. And then right here it says, and conveyed us into the kingdom of the son of his love. Now this is what's so powerful about that word conveyed or transferred, is this word in its ancient context, and 
uh, Greek. I can't remember what the word is right now, so I apologize. Um, it actually is talking about a king who would come into a nation after he's conquered it, taken it over, and he would take the people out of their home country and convey them into his own, transfer them into his own. And this was a practice of uh, ancient rulers and kings when they conquered and kind of in order to establish their kingdom and to keep those nations from rising up again as we just bring them into our kingdom and put them there. And then they would sometimes put other people in those other cities. And that's the language God is using here through Paul. You and I have been conveyed when Christ saved us. When God saved us, we were actually taken out of darkness and we were placed in his kingdom, the kingdom of his light. I love that. Transferred into the kingdom of the son of his love. And that's a Hebraic phrase for, uh, what is it? I forgot. Let me look at my notes. Oh my gosh. It's not like life altering, but we've already gone this far, so I should just finish it. Hang in there. Oh, there it is. It's Hebraic for the idea of God's dear son. That's embarrassing. I forgot. Whoops. Um, <laughs> so the son of his love, God's dear son. And it reminds me of Paul writing in 1 Timothy where he said uh, that you and I have not been given a spirit of fear. But do you remember we've been given? A spirit of love, power, and of a sound mind. The kingdom of the son of his love. It's a kingdom of power, love, and a sound mind delivered from bondage, conveyed into the kingdom of his son. Verse 14, and now we're going to talk about Jesus, and I love these verses. In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sin. That's the answer. That's how we've been conveyed, transferred out. That's how we've been qualified. It's because of the redemption of Jesus Christ in yours and mine's life through his blood, his forgiveness. And the idea of redemption is legal ransom. I've always loved the picture of the slave market of sin. That's kind of what that word redem redemption denotes. And it's a graphic term. We don't really like that term. Um, but that's the imagery we're getting from this, that you and I were under the bondage of Satan. And yet we've been legally ransomed by the blood of Jesus. Jesus paid the price that we couldn't pay for ourselves to be set free. And now you and I in Christ are God's free men. We're his children. No longer slaves to sin, Romans says. We're slaves to righteousness. We belong to God, ransomed out. It says here through his blood, the forgiveness. And this idea of forgiveness, this word here, is literally in its rendering like ascending away. Like when God forgave you and I, he sent away what he forgave. In fact, David would say it like this, that God has removed from him or from, removed from us, our transgressions as far as the east is from the west. And that's a powerful, um, awing thought that when God forgives, it's like as far as the east is from the west, when we come to Christ and he forgives us, that's how far he's removed our transgressions from us. He sent it away. He remembers it no more. You are forgiven. You are pardoned in Jesus Christ. What a powerful truth. And he goes on to say about Jesus, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him, all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. I love this. Let's go back and break it down slowly um, here at the end, because this is the juicy chunk to me. It says, he is the image of the invisible God. God. What does that mean? That means that Jesus is the likeness and the manifestation of God. And when I say likeness, I mean it's the idea of the mirror. And when I say manifestation, I mean it's the idea of fully God. Jesus is the expressed image of the Father. If you wanted to know what God was like, you just need to go back and study the life of Jesus. That's what this means. For all those who wonder, what is God truly like? Paul is saying he is Jesus. That is what he's truly like. Jesus has come and expressed the Father to the world. When Philip said to Jesus, show us the Father and it will be enough, Jesus said to Philip, he said, Philip, have you known me this long? And you're saying, show me the Father? He's like, Philip, you've known me. 
And if you've known me, then you've known the Father. Jesus would claim that he and the Father are one. He is fully God of fully God. Jesus taking on flesh, but still being fully God, representing to the world who God is. And that's a powerful truth. God is revealed in the person of Jesus Christ. And why should he not be? That's what Paul's getting at this. For those who would question the deity of Jesus, we have so many scriptures that say, no, Jesus is not just man. Sure, the child was born, but Isaiah says the son was given, the son of God. The one Micah would say whose, whose um, footsteps are from everlasting, his going for us. The eternal God come down taking on flesh, revealing himself to mankind. And so Jesus, the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. This is a piece where uh, false doctrines, cults have taken a hold of this. And they say, see, it says firstborn, he was created. But that's a misunderstanding of this word prototokos. Okay, prototokos. I think I'm saying that right. This is speaking of Jesus' position and priority and supremacy over creation. Not talking about him being born or made. Jesus is the creator of all created things. And this very text is going to establish that here in a couple sec in a couple seconds. But it's this idea of Jesus being preeminent. And we'll see that at the end of this passage. And preeminent in the English language is defined as surpassing all. Isn't that beautiful? Jesus is the one that surpasses all. That's what Paul is writing here. He is the superior one. That's also what preeminence means. He's superior to all other beings, to all other created things, to all other um, invisible and visible things. Jesus surpasses all because he is the firstborn. He is the creator. He is very God of very God. And look what it says right here. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth. Through him. John also confirms this in his gospel that in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God and through him, all things were created. Jesus Christ, the creator of the world. The expressed image, the image of the invisible God. And look what it says. And he's created in all things that were created in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, so the material world and the supernatural spiritual world, whether thrones or dominions. And that's, I think that's talking about um, many things. So you got like nations and all sorts of stuff, but it's also speaking of spiritual principalities, angels, demons, ranks of angels. God is the creator of all of it. Now you might go, why would God create demons and all that? You need to go back in the Bible and study that in the beginning, everything was good. And then there was a rebellion of angels and there was also a rebellion of man, which is why we're where we're at today. But in God's creation, it was good in the beginning. It's all created through the Lord, whether visible, invisible, thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. But check this out. All things were created through him and for him. I love this. And he is before all things and in him all things consist. Guys, it is mysterious to me when I think about why would God create what he's created? Why would Jesus, knowing that angels would rebel from him and Satan would rebel and demons and all this, why would he ever create them? That's a hard question to answer. Here's a harder one. Why would he create you and me in his own image and love us if he knew that we would reject him? Guys, the manifold wisdom of God, it's beyond you and me, that God would create people like you and I in his own image, image bearers of God, knowing that yes, we would fall, but in his love, he would pursue us relentlessly and die for us to redeem us. That's the power of this message. Not only did he create man and love man, but when man fell, he, he made a way through his son to redeem man back to himself. And all along, that's been his plan. And it says here that, that because of him, through him, all things exist and that it's for him. It's created by him and it's created for him. Guys, this whole universe is Christ-centric. All of it, the heavens, the earth, the people that dwell therein, all the 
angelic beings of the universe and of the hosts of heaven, God says they're all for Jesus. This is a Christ-centric universe. And check out what it says right here about him. It says um, that in him all things consist. More than gravity that holds the world together, Jesus holds the universe together. He truly holds the whole world in his hand. Isaiah 40, 12, is talk, Isaiah's talking about God. And he's asking some questions about God um, that declare who God is. And one of the things that he says is, um, like, who has measured the universe in the span? And that idea of a span is an ancient uh, culture is between the thumb and the pinky. It's the idea that God spanned his hand, almost like saying, I'll make the universe this big. Now, is God a giant being like that? Well, it's obviously it's, um, they're using terms that describe God's dominance and his power. But it's, God is in his infiniteness. He holds the world together, the universe, the heavens, all those neutrons or neurons, whatever they are, that are spinning around positively charged and science can't figure out what holds them together. Jesus holds them together. All things are for him and through him and consist because of him. Well, let's wrap this up. It says, and he is the head of the body, the church who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. And just as God is the head of all things, even in creation, so he is the head of his church, his people. He is the source of his church. He is the preeminent one. It says that he's the firstborn from the dead. Now, you might be like, how does that work? Because I've read the gospel. Jesus has raised other people from the dead. But you need to understand that they were raised from the dead back to a mortal body, back to a mortal situation where they were going to die again, right? But Jesus, when he died, when he came back from the dead, he came back glorified in a glorified body. Jesus died and will never know death again. And he has an eternal glorified state. And in that, the Bible says Jesus was the first fruits. He's the example for you and I. How do you and I know that we're gonna live for an eternity? How do you and I know that God plans to take us to be in heaven with him? How do you and I know that we're gonna have a glorified body in a glorified state where we're gonna put off corruption and put on incorruption because we look at Jesus who has gone before us, who is the preeminent one, who is the firstborn from the dead and we see that he's been glorified and exalted and it's proof of who he is and that he can do that work in you and me and that all those who believe in him, though they die, Jesus says they're gonna live. And if they believe in me, they shall never die. He's talking about the eternal life of salvation that only he can give. And so in all of that, Jesus is the superior, surpassing one. And I love that definition of Jesus, the surpassing one. There's none greater, no name higher in heaven or on earth, and no name by which we can be saved other than the name of Jesus. So that's where we're gonna leave it for tonight. And I got a couple questions I wrote out for you in the house church and, and you guys can feel free to ask some questions and have your own discussion. I'm just gonna give you a couple of them to get you going and here's what I got for you. Question number one, Jesus is the preeminent one. It's who he is. Whether you even believe in Jesus or not, he is the preeminent, the surpassing one. But does he have preeminence in your life? And don't just be like, oh, actually I'm saved, so yes. Really think about it. Think about the definition of preeminence, the surpassing one, the superior one. Is Jesus truly preeminent in your life? Are there other loves, other pursuits, other desires that surpass Jesus and his call in you? Are there other things that you treat as superior, prioritized over Jesus? That's question number one. Talk about it. Question number two. We know that God desires you and I to live a fruitful life for him. And so I would ask, are you living a fruitful life <clears throat> in the Lord? Are you living a life that glorifies God? And if not, what needs to change? If you're not bearing fruit, why not? And remember that passage we asked, we are asked, we talked about in 
John 15, where Jesus said, I'm the vine. If you want to bear fruit, you have to abide in me because you can't do it on your own. Apart from me, Jesus said, you can do nothing. And so if your life right now is in a state where it's not, there's not a lot of fruit coming from it, it bears reason to ask yourself, why is that? Are you trying to do it on your own? Are you surrendering and let Christ work through you? Are you abiding in God, in his love, his commands? Are you obeying the Lord? Are you letting him lead you or are you trying to lead him? Guys, those are the two questions I'll give you tonight and you can add your own on from there, but I hope that blesses you and gets you started. God bless you. We'll catch you again next week.